You're watching KCCI, Channel 8, Des Moines. Iowa's news leader and home of live Super Doppler. This is KCCI News Channel 8 at 6. I wanted no one why he was on those drugs. The mother of an Iowa National Guard soldier killed in a truck crash is reacting tonight to a police investigation that faults prescription drugs. We'll have a follow-up to a new Channel 8 something. exclusive. It sounded kind of fishy, and, and after seeing the, the thing on TV the other night, I said, oh, this has got to be one of those. More Iowans become targets of fake check scams, but they see the red flags before it's too late. How our Investigate report helped save one man thousands of dollars. And we'll show you why Clive rescue crews say this intersection is keeping them far too busy. Good evening, everyone. Our top story tonight, new information in a deadly accident that killed two Iowa Guardsmen in Johnston. It was on August 27th of this year that a National Guard semi-truck overturned as it was pulling out of Camp Dodge in Johnston. The accident killed the driver, Specialist Dustin Colby, and his passenger, Staff Sergeant Bruce Palema. As News Channel 8 first reported yesterday, the Johnston Police Department says that Colby was taking prescription pain medicine at the time of the accident. Police say that medication probably affected Colby's ability to drive. Well, now the mother of the driver is reacting to the police investigation, and Jeff Greenwood has new details about those prescriptions as well. Jeff? Kevin, yesterday police told us the soldier who died behind the wheel had taken several prescription drugs, but neither police nor the National Guard would say more. Well, today, the soldier's mother wants to fill in those blanks. I won't let my son be remembered as this person that took drugs and crashed a military truck and killed him and the sergeant. Uh-uh. <laughs> Too proud of a mom to let that happen. Misty Tho of Mason City wants to do for her son what the government couldn't. On Thursday, the Johnston Police Department said Iowa National Guard Specialist Dustin Colby, who was behind the wheel of this semi-truck that crashed and killed both him and Staff Sergeant Bruce Palama, had taken prescription drugs that likely factored in the crash. Neither police nor the Iowa National Guard would provide details about the drugs or Specialist Colby's reasons for taking them. His mother now wants to make that public. He's on prescription drugs because of a oral surgery that he had to have a wisdom tooth removed um, that was requested by the military um, before, he went, before they went overseas to Iraq. Polk County Medical Examiner Dr. Gregory Schmunk says uh, the soldier had taken three different prescription strength painkillers, codeine, a narcotic, propoxyphene, and hydrocodone, another narcotic. Dr. Schmunk says records show the soldier saw a dentist on July 26, one month before the crash, and began taking one of the prescriptions. On August 16th, that same dentist pulled the tooth. Five days later, an emergency room doctor prescribed a different medication for pain. Two days later, another dentist prescribed yet another medication, the third painkiller. Four days later, the deadly crash. All of these can make you somewhat sleepy, but he had just exited the base. There's no way that he fell asleep in that short period of time. What may have happened is something happened inside the vehicle. He was distracted, lost control of the vehicle. It started to go down in the grade. And then the question is, did the medications that he have on board uh, cause him to be less able to compensate for the accident? Since the accident, investigators with the Iowa National Guard and the U.S. Army have looked into whether the soldier's commanders knew or should have known about his medications. I'm angry, hurt, confused, everything right now because it's nobody knows yet. We may know next week. The Iowa National Guard plans to release details of the Guard and U.S. Army investigations uh, anytime next week. And Kevin will stay on top of the story. Indeed we will. Thank you very much, Jeff. We now know the name of a man whose body was found under a Des Moines bridge this week. Investigators identified the body as that of 49-year-old Lonnie Lee Bauer. A group of teenagers found his body Wednesday evening under the Southeast 5th Street Bridge. An autopsy indicates he died from natural causes, but a final determination will not be made until toxicology tests are complete. One of two orangutans recently brought to a Des Moines research facility has died. Inda, a 24-year-old ape, moved into the Great Ape Trust facility on Des Moines' southeast side two months ago. Veterinarians noticed Inda was not eating properly. An examination uncovered that a bowel problem the ape had suffered all her life from had reached a terminal state. 
Inda was then euthanized last night. Her companion, 27-year-old AZ, remains at the Great Ape Trust. Investigators in Clive now believe they have determined a cause for that fire at an apartment building this, uh, earlier this week. The blaze broke out just after 12 noon on Tuesday. Uh, though they have pinpointed the origin, authorities are not officially releasing the details right now. The fire department still had control of the building today to dispose of chemicals that one resident had for a model rocket hobby. Those chemicals did not start the fire, but did fuel it. Firefighters heard explosions as they went inside the building Tuesday. We had some concerns going inside, and but we we went inside to try to make an initial attack on the on the on the residents, and and command felt that it was unsafe for us to be there, so then that's when they pulled us out. Investigators say they expect to release more information on Monday. The past couple of nights, News Channel 8 has been warning you about the online scam known as the Nigerian counterfeit check scam. And it turns out our warning paid off for our viewers. News Channel 8's Travis Graven has their stories tonight. What happened, Travis? Well, Jeanette, we talked to two people today who saw how the scam targeted other Iowans and then realized they were about to be scammed themselves. Uh, five $1,000 postal money orders. Alan Kessler got the delivery this morning. Counterfeit money orders, supposedly from a guy living in Canada. Kessler lives alone in this four-bedroom house in Des Moines, so he had put an ad on the internet for one of his uh, bedrooms. Hey, this was the room that, uh, that I was supposed to rent to him. $180, a half month's rent, was all he needed. Instead, he got $5,000 in checks. I'm going to cash $5,000, send him $4,800, and and change. He almost fell for it. It sounded legit and the money orders look authentic. They play on the trust and then they don't give you time to think about it. Uh, it's a house up near Sailorville Lake uh, in the Ankeny area. Bill Whitron uh, is trying to sell his whole house online and now finds himself in the middle of a scam too. Supposedly a, a check is on its way and uh, when I get that I'm supposed to wire them money. Just today he received an email saying he'd be getting five thousand dollars. One thousand is supposed to be spent here, the rest sent back to the interested buyer in England. Whitron says a few days ago he would have done it. Tipped me off that this was probably the same as the check scam that I saw on the news the other night. Now he's listing his home with a realtor and warning others to beware of bogus buyers. The consumer really doesn't have any buddy there to, to guard them against this kind of thing. Now the bottom line, and we've all heard it before, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Thankfully, these gentlemen caught the scam before it was too late, but some folks aren't quite as lucky. Any recourse for the victims of these scams, Travis? In many cases, Jeanette, there really isn't the banks hold you responsible for that money. Again, buyer or seller in this case, beware. That's right. Thanks, Travis. Uh, we can't really hold John McLaughlin responsible oh, for sure the we weather, can. but a lot of people do, and if they were to do that, John, they'd be chilling. Yeah, a little chilly at night, a little sunny during the day. Just another comment on the story you just saw. No matter what you're selling online, those scammers out there use automated scripts and just send you these emails. We get several a day even here in the weather office for various things. Let's talk about what's going out. The temperature-wise right now, a little bit on the chilly side. We're seeing readings in the upper 30s up in the, the Laverne area, 41, Webster City. Work your way south into Des Moines, about 39, and Sheraton currently at 40 degrees. Weather headlines will be dropping down into the 20s once again tonight. Plenty of sunshine Saturday, and oh, just slightly warmer. Might hit 50 degrees if everything goes just right tomorrow. Looks pretty good overall. Thank you, you John. Mm -hmm. I'm Cynthia Fodor. I'll show you why this intersection in Clive is becoming increasingly dangerous. And the high school football playoffs enter the semifinals and enter the Unidome. Mark Meisenheimer has an update live from Cedar Falls a little bit later. You're watching KCCI News Channel 8 at 6. Iowa's news leader with Kevin Cooney, Jeanette Trumpeter, Heidi Soliday Sports, and meteorologist John McLaughlin with exclusive live Super Doppler weather. This is KCCI News Channel 8. I've seen people clipping along over the speed limit uh, quite often. As the area between the Des Moines metro area and Adel continues to be developed, the number of accidents is also on the rise. As a matter of fact, over the past two years, we've seen major development along Hickman Road into Waukee. And Clive authorities say they're responding to more emergency calls out west, and they expect it to get worse. That's what News Channel 8 Cynthia Fodor shows us tonight. 
Authorities say this is what happens when a driver is in a hurry. This one ran the red light here at Hickman and Northwest 156th, hit a truck, and ended up in the hospital. If somebody tries to jump a yellow or, or uh, jump their green a little early, if they get hit by the east or westbound traffic, that traffic's usually going at least 55 miles an hour, so the impact's pretty great. High Fire Marshal Tony Collins is becoming increasingly concerned with the increasing speeds on Highway 6 out to Adel. It's not the little road in the country it used to be. Uh, like I say, it's a four-lane divided highway now. The traffic load has increased dramatically. A lot of commuters come in from the west, from Dallas and Guthrie counties. We watched as this car and many others went flying through yellow lights turning red. You want to watch this car get hit behind you that's out of gas? More than a dozen accidents have occurred on Hickman along with a recent development. Well, this is all new and then this was new and now the Walgreens is coming and of course the Ford Place and the Earl May and the car wash down there. For Kelly yeah. Vale, driving is. is more challenging. And it, and it seems like this light never ever turns green <laughs> fast enough. We need an arrow here too, but it is getting a lot more congested. This corner is about to become even more congested since this brand new Walgreens is set to open any day now. Which is why five authorities want to remind drivers to slow down and be careful as the roads here continue to burst with new businesses, every day becoming more dangerous. Cynthia Fodor, News Channel 8. Now, even the Clive Fire Department may be moving farther west. A new fire station is in the planning stages for Northwest 156th. Well, today marks a two-week milestone for a pair of groundbreaking transplant patients. Doctors at the Transplant Center of Iowa Health uh, performed the state's first double kidney transplant swap. Now, here's how it works. Karen Schoenbeck wanted to donate a kidney to her sister, Linda, but they weren't matches. So Cheryl Ponce ran into the same problem when she tried to donate a kidney to her sister, Tara. So Karen and Cheryl donated to the other sister. Karen Schoenbach says swapping kidneys allowed both women to help, even if they didn't donate to the person they originally intended to. We got to meet yesterday for the first time and it was awesome to see her, you know, see somebody doing so well. She just looks so awesome. Thank you. I was excited you do. <laughs> There are more than 60,000 people awaiting kidney transplants in the United States. A little cool this weekend, but temperatures, well, the sunshine will help out a little bit. Super Doppler details next. KCCI Storm Team 8 is your only team of four certified meteorologists keeping you safe under an umbrella of protection. Cool day today, but with the sunshine, at least it didn't feel so bad. Maybe just a light jacket and kind of stay out of the wind, although it wasn't really too strong either. Right now, let's take a look at the current temperature. It's at 40 degrees, just a few clouds overhead. You have to kind of strain to see those. A lot of stars out there. Calm wind, 19 the dew point. So again, very dry air with light winds, low amount of moisture in the air. The temperature can fall quite quickly. 43% humidity and the pressure, 30.50. Let's check outside one of our webcams down to Winterset we go. Folks still running into the pharmacy there. You can see a, still a few cars on the downtown area. But as we head through the next couple of days and get temperatures a little warmer, probably get a little bustling in downtown Winterset. As far as temperatures, we're going to head to the north tonight because as you get out of the metro area, it is a little bit cooler. Notice Rock Run Elementary up in Iowa Falls, 37 degrees right now. Winds are practically calm as there is a high pressure area right on top of the state. The peak wind today only at 12 miles per hour. Across the upper Midwest with that high pressure area, temperature is fairly uniform across Iowa up in Minnesota. As you get further south, more of a southeasterly wind today and they saw readings in the mid 40s to even near 50 degrees. Just a little bit of cloud cover kind of drifting into central Iowa right now. More significant clouds as you head down to the south. A few of those will spread into Iowa overnight, but we're going to call it mostly clear tonight. Now here's that high pressure area. Again, it brings sinking air. Sinking air, hard to get the clouds to stick around. Now tomorrow the high will drift ever so slowly to the east. That will allow our winds to kind of be east to southeast. And even though I have a little southerly component, really not much warmer tomorrow than today. Maybe in the neighborhood of 4 to 5 degrees, but a fairly pleasant day with quite a bit of sunshine. And then on Sunday, a degree or two warmer. Chilly night ahead, 23 degrees. East to northeast winds, quite light, generally 5 miles per hour. During the day tomorrow, we'll call it mostly sunny, 49 for the high, and the winds again very light out of the east to southeast, 
at 5 to 10. As we head through the next several days, temperatures will slowly climb 48 on Sunday, 49 on Monday, low 50s toward the middle portion of the week, and by Wednesday we're talking about 53 degrees. Temperatures staying above freezing. Yeah. That means any precip we get on Tuesday will be rain and not snow. So thankful for that. It is the holiday season not almost. Not no, it's the season to be thankful for yes. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, John. Hey, what's going on up at the Unidome? I think they're playing a little football up there. Mark Meisenheimer is live. They are playing a little football, Kevin and Jeanette, and Valley is playing very well. I'm Mark Meisenheimer. I'll have a live report from Unidome coming up in sports. Live Super Doppler 8 radar on the iowachannel.com is sponsored by the John Stoddard Cancer Center at Iowa Methodist. The name you've always known and trusted for cancer care. It's Football Friday Night, the playoff edition. The high school postseason kicked off 10 days ago. Today it reached the semifinal level. The dream of all Iowa high school teams is to get to the Dome. Ankeny and Valley have meeting for the third straight season in the semis. Mark Meisenheimer standing by live via New Star 8 at the Unidome in Cedar Falls to tell us what's happened. Mark? Heidi, it's been more of the same. Valley dominating Ankeny early on. Zach Sandvig, he scored, he scored three touchdowns so far. This one for 51 yards to make it a 14-3 Valley lead. They even went to the air in this game. Jason Krull connecting on a 47-yard pass to Jeff Seligman. Valley is up 21-3. They are running away with this one. They get a big defensive play from Todd Young to end the half. He recovers a fumble and returns it 26 yards for the touchdown. Valley led 28-3 at the half. Right now, behind me, Valley leading 42-10 in the third quarter. They are threatening again, but Class 4A semifinals, not the only thing, of course, going on at the Dome today. We had the Class A semifinals, and Clint Jairus updates us on those games. Game one featured Northwood Kensett and North Mahaska. The Warhawks from North Mahaska literally fumbling away their first half lead. An 87-yard return on this fumble tied the game for Northwood Kensett. Another third quarter fumble set up a 32-yard field goal that gave Northwood Kensett a 17-14 lead. But with time running out in the fourth quarter, Levi Ferguson redeems himself with the game-winning touchdown. North Mahaska wins it 21-17. We just made too many mistakes, but in the end, yeah, we went behind our horses, gave it to our pony, and, and let him go. On the other side of the bracket, two undefeated teams, West Bend Mallard and Madrid squaring off. For Madrid, everything that could go wrong did go wrong after losing their starting quarterback early in the game. This interception led to one touchdown. The fumbled exchange led to another. And West Bend Mallard dominates the Tigers on their way to the Class A championship game. You know, I knew we could probably get beat by West Bend, but I didn't expect this to happen. And, I, you know, everything... And, in my heart goes out to West Bend. They did a great job. Back here in the Class 4A game, Valley has scored again. It is now 49 to 10, so the Tigers look like they will extend their winning streak to 30 games. They play, of course, Iowa City High or Bettendorf in the championship. Heidi? All right, thanks a lot, Mark. We'll hear from you again at 10. The Ankeny Hawkettes are digging the state volleyball tournament. That's after eliminating Cedar Falls this afternoon. Four semis at the U.S. Cellular Center. Tammy Peter to Amanda Norellius, but the Tigers return it. That was Sarah Oxman for the block. Tigers serving Jessica Norton to Peter, and Oxman bangs down one of her team-high 17 kills. The match winner, Laura Swoboda, serving Cedar Falls returns. The dig by Chelsea Wood, and Norellius kills home the match. A happy bunch of Hawkettes. Ankeny top Cedar Falls in four. Afterwards, Coach Dave Wims talked about what got Ankeny back to the state finals. You know, the first game we won because of blocks. And that third game and the fourth game we won, I thought, came up really big with the blocks. And then in the fourth game, Sarah Oxman came alive and in the middle and started pounding the ball. Ankeny will play City High for the 4A championship tomorrow afternoon at 1.15. City High beat Iowa City West today. Playing for the Class 3A crown will be Dubuque, Wallard, and West Delaware. Both winners today, and we'll have more semifinal highlights tonight at 10. Iowa's dome away from home, sometimes dubbed Kinnick North, will be a very loud place Saturday morning. Back in November of 2002, Iowa ended the regular season with a colorful win over the Gophers up at the Metrodome, the Hawks' last visit to Minneapolis. The 24-point win had Hawkeye fans and players wearing, carrying, and smelling roses as the Hawks earned a share of the Big Ten title. While the 2004 Hawks could also claim a league title, Iowa's multi-dimensional offense in 2002 is something Coach Kirk Ferentz can only wish for this year. 
you know, in a perfect world, yeah, I'd love to be balanced. You know, I really would offensively. And, uh, you know, we'd love to have, you know, 20 sacks, 20 interceptions defensively. But uh, it's not a perfect world. And I think the bottom line is, you, you know, you, you, you let the team dictate. Uh, the state of your team dictates your philosophy. And, and the bottom line is still about trying to get the job done every Saturday. Iowa at Minnesota at 11 o'clock. KCCI Sports will be at the game and look for our reports tomorrow starting at 6. Also on Saturday, Northern Iowa goes for its sixth consecutive win, hosting Illinois State at 5.05. And the Drake Bulldogs also have a home date, their final regular season game. It's at noon versus Waldorf. So it's a good football tomorrow. Yeah, and the Cyclones off for the week, That's right? right. got the rest. Already. They're not off. It's an open date. That's, That's what right. Max says. Okay, thank you for the clarification, <laughs> Mac. Yes, thanks, Mac. We'll be right back with a look at Wall Street. For up-to-the-minute weather information day or night, call the live Super Doppler 8 network forecast at 247-8880. Sponsored by Touchstone Energy Cooperatives of Iowa. Today's market report is sponsored by the Des Moines office of A.G. Edwards & Sons. Forties on through the weekend, low fifties for early next week. All right. Thank you, John, and thank you for being with us. Enjoy your evening and enjoy your weekend, but come on back and join us at 10.